Hey friends, and welcome to this week's episode of the U-Turn Podcast. This is your host, Ashley Stahl. I'm a counterterrorism professional turned career coach, speaker, and Forbes blogger, and I created the U-Turn Podcast because, let's face it, every now and again, we realize that we're living life on autopilot, and it's time to wake up and make that U-Turn in your life. So prepare to go deep with some of the most transformational people I know, here to help you grow and upgrade your mindset, whether it's in work or love. Also, be sure to stick around for the end of every episode where I'm going to reflect on the conversation and offer actionable coaching insights to have a real impact on your life. In the meantime, we've opened up access to three free e-courses on uturnpodcast.com. So head on over there if you want to land a new job you love, find your purpose, or launch your dream business. All of these courses are totally free. All you got to do is head on over to uturnpodcast.com. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N podcast.com. Now let's get started with this week's guest. We didn't come here to learn lessons. We end up learning lessons. Mm. All of you out there, you are not here to suffer. You are not here to learn lessons. But yes, you are learning lessons because you refuse. You refuse to absolutely allow yourself to feel in a way that's going to Get do away with, yeah, do away with a lot of people and situations in your life. Yes, we're terrified of not being liked. We're terrified. What's going to happen if somebody doesn't like me? Right now, there's somebody listening that doesn't like me. It's not that I don't care in a callous way, but I respect that they don't care for what I have to say. And that's it. It's not going to hurt me. It's not going to hurt you if someone doesn't care for how you present yourself. Diversity was meant to inspire, not intimidate. All right. Hey, everybody. It's Ash here. And I have such a treat for you. It's someone who's mentored me, who's taught me so much. Her name's Tatiana Ray. um, And she is an expert listener. And her role in life is really to bring us into our sensuality, which is how she, what she calls divine romance in action. And I wanted to bring her on to talk about how you can really change your life and set yourself free because her work is all about lies and sensuality. Um, So Tatiana, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. I'm very excited and I'm excited to attempt to uh, speak to everybody about something that they really want to hear. Yeah, honestly, I think um, I know those of you who've been listening to U-Turn usually listen to the podcast back to back. I've heard from a lot of you guys who listen to all the episodes and this is definitely one you're going to want to stick around for because, I mean, Tatiana, you have so many interesting concepts and I'm kind of curious because I've never really asked you like what got you into this work. Well, I was born, I'm full Apache on my father's side, and my mother's from Mexico. And because of my age, I'm 68, because of my age, when I was born, what you all are considering now organic was just a way of being for us. So we didn't use medicine. My parents grew a lot of the food we ate in terms of vegetables and things. We had an orchard. So I grew up very, very holistically mm-hmm. is the word we would use today, which makes me laugh. And I sh- grew up shamanic. My father is shaman, was. He died in 2015. Mm-hmm. So I was raised this way. I was raised shamanically. I was also identified that I could see energy when I was four years old. And it was um, encouraged and educated. Mm-hmm. So I was raised very strictly so that I could learn to observe. In our lineage, we are observers. At being Apache? Yes. Okay. And when you say see energy, I know what? that a lot of people are, are very spiritually open and curious. Like, what does that look like? Or pun intended, what does that mean for you? And how do you see it? I literally see it. You right now, for instance, when I look at your energy, there's... I'm not a medical medium, but I can see that there's a little inflammation red spot around your elbow so that would be your left elbow Hmm. um i can see that your thoracic area is very open which what i i would assume right now it's because we're talking and you're interested and you're excited Hmm. so the whole thoracic area is very very lit up right now 
um, I see in your brain area. So I don't see you as a person. Mm-hmm. I see the energy more like in a real loose, like a lava lamp-ish type person. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> That's so funny. I love that. And we're all just a bunch of lava lamps to you. <laughs> That's great. You said something about my brain. Do tell. Uh-huh. Well, you're... you're like it, it's like a loose interpretation. You know how when they draw the chalk line on the floor if somebody dies? Yeah. Okay, it's like that. It's not a real tight picture of energy. It's it's a loose energy, but it is in the form of kind of humanish. Mm. And so when I look at the top, which is, I'm assuming is your brain, mm-hmm. and your energy right now, your brain is it's very white right now, very white, which means you're totally open. My interpretation, once again, my interpretation over all these years and what I was taught is that you're very open, you're very sincere, um, you're eager mm-hmm. because white is a, is a certain purity, but it also, I don't see any discolorations in there. Mm-hmm. Like if you were upset with me, I would see some dark areas. If you were scared, you would definitely have some uh, red areas, you know? Mm, interesting. But yours, yours is just happy and white and let's go. Mm, I am. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like I interview so many people on the show and there's a small percent of episodes that I don't air because I see my audience, you know, stop listening if I air something that doesn't feel like it's going to be of huge service to them. So I think I get, I'm excited to have you because I just know how much value everybody's going to get out of the work that we're about to get into. And so, yeah, you're right. White brain, Full heart. <laughs> um, well, so I'm kind of curious, you know, like growing up this way, it's like a lot of people grew up in a, um, you know, like a home with, you know, connected to the earth where maybe they're not everyone, obviously, definitely not everyone. Um, but there are some people who grew up where their parents grew the food and they ate really healthy and they didn't have medicine. Um, but they didn't come out like you did, where you just seem to be such a masterful observer. And I'm curious, kind of going into your work around sensuality and lies, like what is that, what are those two focuses for you? And what does it mean to you when you say that you focus on sensuality and you say you focus on lies? In other words, we do have a body right now. We are spirit. When we say we are one, we are one in the sense of the energy of which we are comprised. So you and I are one because we come like in the laboratory, we come from energy and that energy is just one, one enormous what would we say, an amalgamation of little bubbles, let's call them, like like uh, soap bubbles, okay? Mm-hmm. And these soap bubbles coalesce, coagulate, and they f- form and reform. Right now, you and I happen to look like humans, and we happen to have included a lot of pieces, and we're female humans, you know, but this apparatus into which I'm speaking right now is also the very same energy. It's just that it's called a phone. Mm-hmm. So we we are entirely one. Anything and everything. Nothing is inanimate. Walt Disney had it right. Mm. So interesting. And mm-hmm. I think a lot about how our bodies are, you know, what, like 70% water and how that's mm-hmm. kind of like a cucumber. Like we're just a yes. bunch of cucumbers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I call us potatoes. So I'm curious kind of going into your few points. The first point you talk about with me and that I learned a lot from you with was you know what you know, and then you spend the rest of the day trying not to know it. So can you talk to to everyone just a little bit about like what that looks like for them? Yes. Everybody that is listening right now has intuition, or we can call it common sense, or you can call it silent knowing, or you can call it that gut feeling. Okay, these are all different ways of saying your instinct, your intuition. And what does that mean? That means that is the direct line you have to the all of all, or the universe, or God, whatever word you're comfortable with, the goddess. Mm -hmm. And what this connection means is you are always, always, always being guided. Always. You know what you know within seconds. But whatever it is you know is always a solution. And it's in uh, applying the solution. It's applying the solution. So you have a, a problem. And within, within seconds, you know what you need to do. But in order to do what you need to do, something has got to shift. Something is going to change. And that's when we don't have problems. We have problems applying the solution. Mm, Interesting. Okay. And, I mean, a lot of people, they would argue that they 
I think a lot of people aren't connected to themselves. And so they don't, even though they feel something, they're not even as aware to feel what they feel. Yes, but they will know that they don't like it or they like it or they will know that they're confused. And anytime you're confused, there's no such thing as confusion. Mm. If you're confused, you feel helpless to apply what you know to be the solution. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I think, you know, for me, this is just such good work because it was, you know, like my business, it's like you watched me create a business that was thriving and you caught me after that when, when you mentored me a bit. And I remember, um, knowing that something had to change with my business, but not feeling like, like feeling a sense of powerlessness, like, like, Oh my God, this is so overwhelming to shift or make a decision. So I'm kind of curious, like when it is so simple, you know what you know, but you are trying not to know it. In my case, it was like, this change is scary. Why do you think people are so resistant to just making a change? We're very resistant and it is very frightening. It is very, very frightening. I completely have great empathy and compassion. I was in a 21 year marriage and six months in, I knew to get out. Wow. You know, well, if if we really want to be honest, the night I met him, I knew don't do it. Wow. Okay. I knew it. I knew it. It wasn't the type of person I needed to be with. And I turned around and married him and I stayed there 21 years and I had children. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I leave? Well, in the beginning, it was because of, well, what's society going to say? I've only been married six months and we got married and now we're going to get divorced. What are people going to say? And then a little while more into it, it was starting to get comfortable. And then a little while more into it, then now we have a lot of money. And then a little while more into it, now we have children. Mm. So it was always extraneous reasons. What are people going to say? How am I going to be viewed? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's very common, right, that people will commit even deeper when they know something isn't right for them. Like, why? Like, I'm listening to you say you knew something, and not only did you know that and sit with that, but you kept committing even more. What do you think that is? Because you could have, you know, like, after you worked past the six-month block, it's like, next it was making money and all these different steps. Like, why do you think some people commit even I more? I didn't want to be inconvenienced. Hmm. And you think, would you say that this is the reason for most people? For everybody. Everybody has achieved a level of convenience. Mm. Even if it's painful, it's a level of convenience in the sense that you're aware of what and how you're inconvenienced. Interesting. And, you know, I I think a lot about relationships and and I, I think you give a good example because a lot of people have to work through issues in relationships. You know, it's not like... And so how do you know when this is something not workable and this isn't good for me versus, oh, this is an issue that I don't enjoy in our connection, but I want to work through this with you? When you don't enjoy a situation and the partner is also willing to listen to what you don't enjoy, okay? Mm -hmm. You have to have two people that are willing to be willing. Mm. A relationship is about two, well, or more, but a relationship is about two people. Two people, it doesn't matter the sexes, it doesn't matter the ages. I'm just talking about a a relationship, maybe even a babysitter with a child. But it's about two people that must be willing to be willing Mm. to understand that we are attempting to get along here. Mm. So I'm not talking compromise. I'm talking understanding. Interesting. Okay. And even that, even in that case, right, Tatiana, like it's possible that two people could be not a great match for each other and like somebody has a knowing. So I'm I'm trying to help because I think a lot of people struggle to figure out what's their instinct that they know something and they need to move forward on it, even if they're scared versus what's just difficult, you know? Your instinct is always, this is too difficult. Your instinct is always, this is too difficult. I mean, uh, you climb up to the uh, high dive. I remember when I was, I don't know, 10 or 12, I really, really wanted to jump off the high dive. And I got all the way up to the high dive and I stood up there and I looked down and my instinct was that I really wanted to do it, but I was afraid, Mm. but I really wanted to do it. Mm. I wanted to jump and yes, I was afraid, but my instinct was I wanted to jump. Interesting. Okay. So it's like you can hold both. You can hold, this is hard and I still want to do it. Yes. 
or you can hold, I climbed all the way up there and I said, oh, hell no. And I got back down. Yeah. Cause I think what happens is there's like pain or something in our relationships and somebody will say to themselves, this feels really hard. And that's what, the first What step. you're doing is you're recreating your nest energy. One thing that I don't feel we're educated on, we are not educated in our system. We are not domesticated to understand that instances, situations complete themselves. There is no shame to divorce. There is no shame to no longer wanting to be in a certain relationship. There is no shame in uh, changing jobs. There's no shame in that. We use shame in our... Um, domestication. This is how we keep each other, um, what would you call it, in control? Yeah. Well, and can you explain, I, nest energy and domestication are two cores to your work that I think are really powerful. Can you explain what domestication means for everybody listening? Because I'm guessing that this is a good term for them to start noticing with themselves. Yes. Um, I was in psychology and I left it. I left it behind because it's appropriate. There are a lot of rules that you can and cannot say. It's it's completely appropriate, but I didn't want to be held by those rules. So now without a license, I can say what I need to say. I can get to the core of whatever we're talking about. Nest energy is simply another way of saying we all grew up in an environment that is in very, very particular to us, it's like little baby birds. So you grow up in a hummingbird nest or a pigeon nest or an eagle nest, you know, or a seagull nest. But what you grew up in is what you learned. No shame, no blame, but that's what you learned and that's how you learned it. Mm. That's how you learned it. Then you go and you start interacting in the world and there's all sorts of different birds and all sorts of different ways of doing what they do because that's how they were taught. Mm. So nest energy, you really need to begin to understand that you do what you do. There's nothing original to us in the beginning. Not a damn thing. Mm. There's nothing original. We do everything that either our mother, our father, or our grandparents, or our ancestors did. There's nothing original. Mm. And kind of like we come out of our nest, and then there's like domestication, which is this idea, right, that um, we do things that... I, the way I hold it, Tatiana, is like we do what feels appropriate. Or... Appropriate. And that's a beautiful word, appropriate. But mm-hmm. appropriate is not always what I want to do, what I'm feeling to do. Mm-hmm. In other words, my husband, we've been married 10 years. My husband is 27 years younger than me. Mm-hmm. When we got married, he was 30. I was 57. We are now 40 mm-hmm. and 67. Mm-hmm. You see, that's completely inappropriate according to society or domestication. But it was right and is right for us. Why? Because we are two individuals that are willing. We want to be together. We want to discuss things when it's necessary. We like each other. Mm, That's so powerful. And I think, what are some things that you notice are just pure domestication? I'm trying to find that kind of thread that translates to anyone who's listening, like, like little things that people do that they don't even realize are so domesticated. You know you're domesticated when you have to go to family functions that you absolutely do not want to go to. Mm. You know you're domesticated when you hear the phrase, my mother sacrificed so much for me. Mm. No, I didn't. Mm. Nobody made me have sex. Nobody made me have the baby. Nobody made me raise the baby. I didn't sacrifice, and I was a single parent. It wasn't a sacrifice. It was a choice. And any woman, and I can say this because I'm a mother, any woman that says, I sacrifice, I went through labor. Yeah, and who made you? That's domestication. Interesting. You have no free will. Mm. And do you think there's such a thing as free will? Absolutely. That's what your instinct keeps pushing you toward. <laughs> That's what your instinct, that's what your... Oh, it's so beautiful. You'll have these inclinations. You'll have, I need to quit this grad school program. Or I want to uh, go forth and go to school. Or uh, I want to have another baby. I know it sounds crazy, but I want to. Or even I have a baby and I'm going nuts, but I love the child, but it's hard. That's all instinct. Mm. And it's beautiful because it's your GPS. It's your windsock. It points you in a direction of a healthier point of view. Mm. Well, when you talk about instinct, I think a lot, one of the most common questions that 
I hear from people is just how they can, and, and I've asked you this myself, is determining instinct versus fear. So I'm curious for anybody listening how you can best differentiate that because I know you're really good at that. I've learned a lot from you about that. How can we share with everyone listening how they could do that? Instinct versus fear. Instinct is something that arises within you. You don't call it forth. You just feel it. And then the fear that accompanies it generally, and I'll admit, yes, the fear is always the domestication that starts to beat its drums and cymbals and saying the what if, what if, what if. Mm, catastrophizing kind of. Uh-huh. Okay. But when you have instinct, there's just an automatic being drawn toward. It's automatic. It's from inside. It's You just you you yearn to you want to you need to mhm mhm so people can say well what about lust what about lust well i also wonder about control tatiana because you talk about domestication and how like it's it's ideally ideal to kind of be free and do what you whatever you want to do or be whoever you want to be and it's like Sometimes I feel like we all have these urges to go completely buck wild insane, you know? Uh-huh. And it's like, so where is that fine line of, you know, like control where it's like maybe somebody's busting past their domestication and they are getting out of just doing things because it's quote unquote appropriate. Um, but there's like this fine line of like, well, some part of me feels like I want to jump in the pool, but I don't know how to swim. Do you know what I mean? Like following urges and following your freedom but also having a sense of control and and respect for environment. Is it always domestication if you're considering the environment? If we really followed what we're yearning for, we will never hurt ourselves or another. Mm. It's not possible. It's when you're unhappy with yourself that you want to hurt another. Otherwise, it's not when, a, when you're happy, happy. What does happy mean? When, when you are satisfied with your life, when you're at peace with what you're doing, I'm not talking money or status. I'm talking an internal satisfaction. When you have a certain satisfaction, you're not snarky. You're not sarcastic. Mm. You don't roll your eyes. You're genuinely thrilled for others. Mm. And so when we can get to this place within ourselves, the choices you're going to make are always going to be healthy. They're always going to be healthy. Mm. The only reason we make unhealthy choices is because we're trying to hurt somebody and it usually ends up being us. And why would somebody want to do that? Because they, they need to get the poison of the feelings of just being unhappy, going against themselves, going to school because they don't want to go to school, uh, studying a certain subject because that's what the family does, living in a certain place because that's what the family does, or that's what my friends do, feeling guilty if you're married or not married because that's what my friends are doing. Freedom is completely misunderstood. We think freedom, like you mentioned, means running around buck naked. That's not freedom. Freedom is being able to be in the moment and make a pure choice from this is how I would like to experience this. Mm. I was in Cancun once and I had some girlfriends that were supposedly very wild girls, right? So we're in Mr. Uh, Senor Frogs or something like that. It was <laughs> midday, I don't know, two in the afternoon, and there was a big dance floor and a really good little jukebox. So I go over and I found some good music and I put some quarters in and I say, come on, let's dance. Oh no, there's nobody else dancing. And oh no, I have to have a few drinks first. And oh no, oh, f- please. Please, you're wild and crazy because you're drunk? You're wild and crazy because you're high? No, I wasn't drunk. I wasn't high. I hadn't eaten yet. I wanted to dance. The music felt good. Mm. So I got out on the little wooden floor and I danced. Mm. It wasn't for anybody else other than me and the music. It felt good. I didn't need excuses to express myself. Mm. I'm, what I'm hearing from you a lot is this idea that a lot of people lack personal responsibility 
And there's a lot of victimization, like I'm doing this because I have to, or I'm, I'm sacrificed so much for you. And it's like, no, you, you got yourself pregnant and chose to have a kid. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. So, yes. so can you, how do, how do people move from victim to owner? You begin to realize that you're lying to yourself. And this is when I say you're telling a big fat lie and all of you out there listening know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody listening right now, including myself at one time, are big fat liars. Mm. You're lying about something. You're in a relationship you don't want to be in. You're in a job perhaps you don't want to be in. Uh, You're in a part of our country that you don't want to live in. You're doing something that goes absolutely against how you want to experience. And guess what? You did it. And that's okay. No shame, no blame, but accept the responsibility that you made the ultimate choice. Mm -hmm. We feel that we're corralled, that we're herded into our choices. Like you said, call it a victim. There are no victims. There's weak people, no resilience. Mm. And I, I also hear kind of like, um, a sense when I listen to you that you might believe or that it might feel true to you that a lot of people are kind of addicted to being unhappy. Would that sound right? Oh, yes. We're all addicted to suffering. Why is that? Because it feels so much better to be able to lament than to just have a life where there's not that much to talk about. Mm, So it gives us, a lot of people use suffering to connect, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Mm. When, when you're, I mean, think about it. If you wake up and you're fine and you go to a job and, and it's not super duper, but you're happy. You make money that's great. You have a car, you have gasoline, you have food on your table. You're a responsible little adult. You have a sweet lover. Oh, but you're not, you know, hanging from a chandelier in Monaco. <laughs> Or like me, you're not like, you know, busting your business with a bunch of TNT and fixing all the drama. (laughs) Exactly. Like coffee, coffee. Everybody's addicted to coffee. Why? Because nobody goes to sleep on time. Nobody gives themselves enough exercise. Nobody eats properly. And everybody's drinking in some way so that when they wake up, they need a shot in the arm. Mm. Our body is so finely tuned. Another reason that people cannot hear or understand or feel what they're feeling is because they've completely polluted themselves to a point where how are you going to hear anything when your body is so busy attempting to detoxify almost every waking moment? Mm. You know, I... I feel for a lot of people listening, including myself, because it's like, I think it's true. And, and I see how a lot of people are creating results in their life right now that are based on a lot of pain because of this kind of addictive nature we have to suffering. And I'm curious for people who are in relationships, what your thoughts are, because I think there's a lot of growth in pain, but then there's some people who choose relationships that are so painful and they buy into this whole belief system that it has to hurt this much for them to grow or to, you know, um, thrive and evolve as the person they want to be. Yes. That's so beautiful that you said it that way because it's perfectly said. Oh, thank you. Perfectly said. No, it's perfectly said. We're, we're taught to believe that if it doesn't hurt, well, how do they say no pain, no gain? Yeah, that's totally a colloquialism. Colloquial, I can't even say that word. Colloquialism, colloquialism yes. yeah. <laughs> or another one is you bit it off, now chew it. Mm. Another one is you made your bed, now lie in it. Okay. Or another one is, um, life is a school, oh, how do they say schoolhouse or schoolroom or something like this? Mm-hmm. You know, we came here to learn lessons. We didn't come here to learn lessons. We end up learning lessons. Mm. All of you out there, you are not here to suffer. You are not here to learn lessons, but yes, you are learning lessons because you refuse. You refuse to absolutely allow yourself to feel in a way that's going to get do away with yeah do away with a lot of people and situations in your life Mm -hmm. yes we're terrified of not being liked we're terrified what's going to happen if somebody doesn't like me right now there's somebody listening that doesn't like me it's not that i don't care in a callous way but i respect 
that they don't care for what I have to say. Mm. And that's it. It's not going to hurt me. It's mm. not going to hurt you if someone doesn't care for how you present yourself. Diversity was meant to inspire, not intimidate. Mm. And this kind of brings me to this question of why do you think we're here? Because a lot of people do have that belief system. We're here to learn and grow. But what, that feels more like when you talk about it, something that happens um, as a byproduct of being here, not the reason we're here. So for you, what is the reason as humans that we're here? Oh, we're here to express ourselves. That's where the sensuality comes in. I mean, when you really take a moment, and it sounds so trite. I mean, it sounds so trite. Look into a flower, watch the clouds. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, think about it. Think about the leaves. Think about how they sound when they rustle. What is the moon like when it's quiet? The, and I mean it. What is the moon like when it's quiet? What is your skin like? What do you smell? I mean, we have these wonderful, wonderful um, conveniences on our body. We have nostrils. We have little orifices in our ears. We have skin that covers 100% of our body. I mean, we, were, we are one big sensing machine. We're meant to pick up signals from our environment. What is your environment? What are you surrounding yourself by? So interesting. And okay, so we've kind of talked about nest energy, domestication, being a victim. You know what you know. Um, but there's another concept that you share around image. You are your image. And I love Mr. Potato Head. So if you could un explain that, because it feels so funny to even talk about Mr. Potato Head at age 32 right now. Um, I haven't even yes. talked about him except for with you. So can you kind of paint for people like how they can start to see what their image is and what that really means? Yes. Um, you are not who people say you are. You came into this world, this beautiful white refrigerator, no magnets, none. You were born and you were this beautiful, beautiful being. And then the mother says, oh my God, she's got her father's nose. And then the nurse says, oh, she has such big eyes. And then somebody else says, oh, she cries really loud. And those are magnets being thrown. Those are um, judgments being laid on this child that is brand spanking new. And this goes on throughout our life. And I've created the term Mr. Potato Head. We are not a Mr. Potato Head. And yet we have this box and you've inherited three pieces, inherited. When I say there's nothing in, uh, original about you, I mean it. Not until you start creating your own pieces. The first piece that you inherit, they're pieces that you like, they work for you. Maybe you're very timely. You learned it from your family. You're very punctual. Great. Works for you. Stays in the box. Next piece. Um, very organized. It works for you, but your family's a little OCD about organization. And you're going to be more casual about organization. So you refine it. You redefine organization for yourself. You make it more yours, but it's still there. Mm. Third piece is you chuck it over your shoulder. This is a piece that maybe your mom was a yeller and a screamer and you decide, oh, I don't want to be a yeller and a screamer anymore. I'm getting rid of this piece. And the fourth piece, those are the fun pieces. Those are the pieces you observe outside of yourself and you want to incorporate them. You want them in your box. You see, you want them in your box. Something that you see outside is maybe like yourself. You're very friendly. You're very available. You're very uh, interested in people. Mm. I have that piece right now, but if I didn't, that would be one of the pieces that I would absolutely study you and watch you in order to create that for myself. Mm, thank you. That's so interesting. <laughs> you know, it's like... Um... Another thing that's kind of, I'm thinking about kind of like Mr. Potato Head, you know, and I think a lot about that, like, you know, how he has like a funny hat, but really that's for me, like my Mr. Potato Head, the, all the pieces I make of myself are like, I like rap music and I like cupcakes and I live in LA. It's like all of these identities. And what I'm finding is that sometimes our families or our relationships hold us hostage almost. And, and I say that without wanting to sound victim, oh, yeah. but they yeah, hold yeah, us hostage yeah to our identities. And 
for me, one that I'm working with right now, so I haven't had time to let you know, but I am finally, like I just got into a relationship um, and it's just the best one I've been in. And it's like the sweetest, most loving, connected guy. And he's just so good to me. Um, but we grew up together. So our families know each other very well. And, um, it's really interesting because my family has a story about me that I'm high maintenance and I don't know if I, I agree. And I have had a lot of friends, maybe it's just perspective. Like I have a lot of friends who I would judge as high maintenance and I love my friends. Um, and so I think through the contrast, I've been like, that feels like high maintenance. I wouldn't need that or want that. Um, and so it's kind of causing me to question, am I really high maintenance? Cause they've been calling me this my whole life. And I've almost felt some shame about it when I'm on family trips because yeah. they're like, Oh, princess yeah. Ashley. And I'm like, why am I? And so this guy that I'm dating was like, you're really not that high maintenance. And he said it kind of like he was surprised. And I'm like, why are you surprised? He's like, well, you know that everybody calls you princess Ashley. I'm like, I don't know why my uncles call me that, you know, like, um, so I'm kind of curious, like, how do high we... maintenance to me would mean to me, yeah. my, my translation of high maintenance would be someone who's inconsiderate. High, um, high maintenance to me in a pure form would mean that this person makes others uncomfortable because they're very clear about this is what I want. This is how I want it. Mm. But then if it goes into being inconsiderate, <clears throat> excuse me, of others, then I can see how they term it high maintenance. Otherwise, I just see a person who knows what they want. That's so interesting. I'm going to start to ask my uncles when they say Princess Ashley, I'll say, why do you think I'm a princess? Like, what is it? Like, out of curiosity, you know, to start to yeah. see. Because maybe there's an opportunity for me if, if anybody in my family is feeling like I'm not considering... I do know that on the trip we go on every year, there's a lot of heavy lifting because we go on a lake trip and there's like canopies and like, you know, all of this equipment. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I, and I'm not, um, the most, like I've been going to the gym lately, but I've never really identified with exercise that much. And so, um, I always kind of like stepped back and didn't lift heavy things. And so they always used to comment about it then, Oh, look at you being high maintenance, not lifting this or that. Um, so maybe there's something there. I'm so curious to ask. Well, they're, we're using shame and blame in that case. I'm not saying they're trying to shame you. They don't even realize they're shaming you. You know, Ashley, there, there's so many times we could be sitting at the table and someone will say something and people will roll their eyes, but it's perfectly acceptable. I've been at a table many times when I will say something and it's, I say it kind because I never want to, um, I never want to speak in a way that I'm going to be insulting, mm. but, but I will say whatever it is I have to say. Well, people hold the truth as insulting sometimes. And they do. And that is what we're looking at right now. High maintenance or Princess Ashley, what is it about you that is making them uncomfortable? Mm. You see? I'm not, I, I, I completely... I'm not sports minded at all, at all, you know, and I don't cook. Oh, here's a good one. I don't cook. I've never cooked. I never learned how to cook. I raised my boys, my sons in restaurants. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would go get the food if I needed to and bring it home and put it on plates. But I, I don't know how to cook. And I have been with women when the topic comes up and they will say, you don't know how to cook. And it's, that's shame and blame. Mm -hmm. They don't realize they're trying to shame me. They really don't. They're not trying to shame me. But the voices and the judgments are that there is something wrong with me as a woman, as a woman human, that I don't know how to cook. Interesting. And they will say, how did you raise your children? I say, in restaurants. <laughs> what, what? What? I don't cook. Yeah. I had to feed them. Yeah. After breastfeeding, once I, once they were breastfed, now they had to eat. <laughs> then we got to get to the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> That's great. That's so funny. No, I just love how you say, I raise my kid in restaurants. Like, it's so funny, and, it's, and you're just owning it, and it's great. And I'm sure you guys were out having fun in places other than restaurants, too, raising them. <laughs> <laughs> but you being a princess, it's like, no, there's something about you. In other words, when I don't cook... And I'm very at peace with, I don't cook. I don't know how to cook. I don't want to learn how to cook. I don't cook. I'm at peace with that. 
What that engenders in people is they begin to feel uncomfortable about something around cooking and food and service. And I don't know. Otherwise, it would be nothing. Oh, you don't cook? Oh. Mm. And you being a princess, what is it about you thinking about yourself? What is it about you knowing what you need? What is it that makes them uncomfortable? Yeah, they, I, I never asked. Like but do they feel like you're making yourself special? You see? Yeah. I don't see you making yourself special. You just don't think about it. But at the same time, would that, could that be a little inconsiderate that you don't think about it? Do you understand how I'm saying this? Yeah, yeah. I, I Well, it's funny because when I hear high maintenance, the story I tell myself is it's somebody who has a lot of demands. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting because when I check in with my own instinct with my family, like there's always been a bit of disconnect. And I think I did have an ego about me when I was growing up because I valued education and college and my cousins didn't really care for it. Like they didn't have an interest in going to school. And that's something I really valued and enjoyed. And it was kind of an identity I had, like being educated. Beautiful. Do you see how you just segued right into the kernel of truth? Mm. So the big fat lie, as I would say to a client, so Ashley, the big fat lie for the family is they're a little ashamed, possibly, that they're not pursuing as high an identity. They don't want as many Mr. Potato Head, new, new Mr. Potato Head pieces in their box as you do. Mm. You like to explore. How many more pieces can I get? You're, you see, you're, you open yourself to life. That makes them uncomfortable, and it's real easy to say Princess Ashley. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I, it's so interesting, and it's also like maybe there's an ego to me where I treated them as if I was better than them for that, you know, like maybe that. Which could have been a defense mechanism on your part because you were feeling that they didn't like you. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, U-Tuners, so sorry for the quick interruption, but I want to make sure you know that this episode has been brought to you by the Career Clarity Lab, the online course to help you find your career purpose in the workforce and upgrade your confidence. So if you're ready to unlock the best career path for you and you'd like to try a free version of our Clarity course, just head on over to U-TurnPodcast.com slash Clarity. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N podcast.com slash Clarity. Now let's get back to this week's episode. And you know, it's so interesting because as an adult, I mean, it, it all goes back to childhood. It's like, I'm noticing that um, I'm totally available to people, but then I make a decision and you probably know this about me for sure. It's like, um, so the people who I'm very close to, there's probably five to 10 women in my life. I'll do anything, like whatever they need. And I'm happy to do it. I really am um, within reason, you know, and, and it doesn't feel like a burden and it doesn't feel like I'm going out of my way. I'm just happy to help. However, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you're not those five to 10 women, I'm not there, you know, like I don't really mm -hmm. have a middle ground and that's how I've managed my energy in my life so far. I'm either in or out. But I love that you don't make apologies and that you're aware of this. I would give you my example would be, I don't consider myself a real friendly person. I don't give parties. I don't have barbecues. You know, I, I'm, I'm, if I'm not on traveling or with a client on the phone, I'm on the couch reading. <laughs> I, I read. I read a lot. I still, I still hold the old-fashioned books in my hands. But the point I'm getting to is if you were to call me at 2 in the morning and there were no Ubers or no Lyfts or no friends available and your, uh, my number is the only one you can remember, I'll come and get you. So you and have follow-through. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you need me, tell me. Tell me you need me and I will be there, but I'm not going to be this person that calls on the phone to keep up with you. Mm. Doesn't, doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean I don't think of you every so often, but I will not reach out. I don't. Interesting. That's so interesting. And, and it's so, it's so powerful to know yourself in that way. Cause for me, I'm, I'm so there. Um, and 
I feel like I'm almost holding certain friendships in an energetic container all, all day long, like, and not in a t- tiring way, just like, a, yeah. oh, I know that this person had a meeting at three o'clock today, or yesterday a friend put their dog down at 2.30 and I texted them at 2.29. You know, it's like... Me? These- See, that's, that's, and that's so beautiful because I've always said this about you. You're very sensitive mm, thank and, you. you're sens- and you're sensitive to those that you want to be close to. Well, it's also though, there's like an extreme to it where it's like, okay, I don't want to always be in a, um, in these extremes, you know, where there's no space for the middle, because I'm guessing that there's some value in, oh, that's the person that I go to the library and work with sometimes versus like, I'm an incredible friend to you and I'm so there or I'm not there at all. Well, there's, a, that's what makes diversity. I, I'm extremely, and I would use the word extremely happy to interact with people on a daily basis, but that's when they fall in my face. Like you said, the librarian or the gas station attendant or the lady at the market or the, or the male lady. I know my male lady. I always, if I run into her, we always have a little chat. That's cute. <laughs> you see? But if, if, if I see her and she's kind of like a few houses away, I'm not going to walk over there. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I love that you know that. Well, I guess kind of going back to like this high maintenance thing or whatever, because I think a lot of people listening probably have a, an identity or a part of their Mr. Potato Head pieces, their identity that or their image that they think they are that comes from what their parents or families keep telling them they are. And yes. I'm guessing somebody's listening right now thinking, you know, my mom always says I'm this, but I'm not. And... So I'm curious why, I get, you kind of answered it. It's like, why do people tell us we are certain things or our families? And one thing you said was if they're uncomfortable, right? Like Yes, absolutely. They're uncomfortable with something in how you are presenting yourself. How dare you? How mm-hmm. dare you? There's, there's generally an audacity behind it. So there's somebody listening right now where they're called in their family, oh, you're the troublemaker. Or there's somebody that's listening right now where their family says, oh, my God, you can never count on them. Mm. Or there's somebody listening right now that, you know, oh, they're always late. Yeah. They never follow through. And there's not a lot of space for the person to shift or no. to be who they are. Well, you begin to believe it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm curious, you know. Like one thing I'm noticing with this, um, like, you know, discomfort in my family is I've, when somebody says you're this or you're that, and it's seen as not a positive thing, um, it feels close. My heart closes a bit, right? Because I don't feel accepted. And so most of my life I've had a really nice relationship with my family, but not a deep one. And, um, I extended family members. I don't even try. Like there's some, I have some cousins that are nice people, but I don't even, I almost feel my heart close when they're like, what's new with you. Sometimes it feels like, I don't, I don't know. You, you think I'm all these things that I'm not, I don't even want to show you what I am. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, I don't even want to show you the rest of my Mr. Potato Head pieces. So this actually brings me to another question for you, or just something I want to explore because I think it's powerful for everybody listening. You have a lot of content around your image and keeping it up um, and like the the way you will barter. Yes. (laughs) Can you explain that concept for everybody? (laughs) Yes. I want all of you who are listening to understand that what I'm saying is you are pure spirit. So you are pure goodness, your kindness, your patience, and your wisdom. You are pure this, pure kindness, patience, wisdom, and generosity. That's what you are in terms of energy. And then you coalesce and you look like you have a body. And then you become your art. And you have the beautiful ability to create yourself any way you want. However, you came into a family, so more than likely you patterned yourself after everybody in your family, mother and father, generally. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm saying to you, if you can really begin to right now realize, oh, I have interchangeable pieces. I've accepted these pieces, but I have interchangeable pieces. So I get to look around and I get to see other attributes that I want to add or subtract from myself as this image. And that's the beautiful part. You're never going to know yourself. You're never going to know how you feel until you start interacting with life 
Immerse yourself. You have skin, you have eyes, you have ears, you have a mouth, you have a tongue. Get in the water, get in the, get into the traffic. I mean, we are so conditioned to be afraid of everything and to go right into tension. Why? So you're in traffic. If you gave yourself enough time, so what? Mm. We have music apparatuses now. Put on the music or put on your little audio book or sit there in silence. Mm. Nurture yourself. What? Every moment is a moment to nurture yourself. You have a new relationship, Ashley. Mm -hmm. And yes, I can completely hear that everyone around you is trying to tell your new relationship how to be mm -hmm. according to how they see you and your beloved. Mm -hmm. So let's pretend if you and your beloved are being really affectionate and he's very, very kind and very affectionate. And then his, I don't know, his mother's going to say, what's his name? Oh my gosh. I haven't said his name on here. I'm so <laughs> scared. He's going to listen to this. Oh, what if we break up by the time this episode comes out? Oh my God. William. <laughs> Okay, see, I always loved how honest you can be. Let him break up before this comes out. <laughs> He's going to hear it. And apparently he mentioned to some people at work that I have this podcast. So like his boss listens to it. So that's like a whole nother layer. But his name okay, is William I'm and I'm going in. <laughs> William, there we go. Okay, so you, you and William are being affectionate. Just plain old, nice, run of the mill, but affectionate. And his mother comes up and says, William, I don't know you to be that affectionate. But she says it with a voice like, huh, ha, 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 And then he gets shy. And then he starts to doubt. Mm. Is he really holding your hand and, and listening to you attentively because he wants to or because he's fake? Mm. She shamed him now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is this no. just people that don't know how to communicate? Is shaming yes. just really people don't even know how to talk and that's the problem? Yes, because as a mother, she might be saying, Oh, William, it's so nice to see you so attentive to her. I miss those days when you were a little boy and you used to be that way with me. Mm. Jeez. Jeez, jeez, jeez. Not even going to comment on that one. <laughs> 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 gonna leave that right here <laughs> oh god I'm like feel like my whole body got like hot like okay <laughs> so um there's like, kind of just going into breaking through like how can somebody start to notice right now perhaps the ways that they have been domesticated with their family and it's not really working for them and how can people start to look at their Mr. Potato Head pieces and go into that place of choice where they can decide if that's who they want to be? They can begin to stalk themselves, S-T-A-L-K. Like you watch yourself, don't judge yourself, no good, no bad, no shame, no blame. But just watch yourself. Watch yourself talking to your child today. You know, are you barking at your child? Are you whining with your child? Are you ignoring your child? Are you over attentive to the child? Just watch. Mm. Just watch. And then say, oh, who used to do that? Oh, that's how my dad does it. He wasn't around that much. But when he was around, he was over attentive. He kind of, he almost like um, smothered us. You know, and my mother, oh, my mother was around all the time, but she was off in La La Land, you see. So so that would mean as a mother, you don't have a happy medium. You're either all there and smothering the child or you're there, but you're not paying any attention to the child, mm. you see. And so just watch yourself. Just watch so you can become familiar with your pieces. Because more than anything, Ashley, Nobody's familiar with the pieces in their box. They're not familiar with their artwork. Mm. And this actually yeah. kind of brings us to that final point that I asked you about is you, you call us pure energy and our art is a composite of Mr. Potato Head. So talk to me about that and personal brands I think are very funny. Yeah, you are a walking art gallery. Mm. A walking art gallery. If we really, like anybody listening to you and I right now, and if they see us as two little Mr. Potato Heads, two little Mrs. Potato Heads talking. Okay? <laughs> Mrs. Potato Head to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Mrs. and you're a Mrs. And 
And so they, they hear us talking. So what do they see as our Mr. Potato Heads? They see that we have pieces that are comfortable with each other. They see that we have pieces that are absolutely available to being honest with each other. They see that we like each other. They see that we don't back away from each other. So what are they going to see? They're going to see friendship. Mm. You see. They're going to see friendship in, in... So the art that you and I are expressing right now is friendship. Mm. You and I are exploring and expressing moment to moment. Like when I said, what's his name? <laughs> and look how beautiful your answer was. <laughs> when you listen back to this, you're going to laugh. <laughs> but like you did when I asked you. <laughs> you know what I was laughing at earlier? I had the weirdest thought. You were talking about how we are all of these things, all these pieces. And I was thinking about those weird cargo pants in the 1990s that had the zipper and like one minute they're pants, then they're shorts, and then they're yes. swim trunks. Yes, yes. And I'm like, we all think we're just cargo pants, but we're shorts, cargo pants, like and swim trunks, like and swim trunks, and then we have all these pockets. You yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> I was just like, oh my god, why do I think like this? But I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> but see, that's what you remember when I used to mentor you. That's what we used to talk about of all the places that you could go with your pieces. It's like you would start digging in your box mm -hmm. <laughs> and look, Tatiana, I have this piece and this piece mm -hmm. and this piece. You see, that's the art. Mm. That's the art. Start by watching yourself with no shame, no blame. Start to be excited about what you find in your box. And yes, they're all going to be pieces that you inherited. Some are going to work. Some have to be tailored. And some have to be thrown out of the box. Mm. And then the fourth piece are the ones that you get to choose. It's your artwork. You are your art. So to help people understand this, because they listen to me talk on this show all the time, what would could you give some examples of what Mr. Potato Head pieces you notice on me for the listeners? Yes. yes. So a piece that you inherited that just works for you, you didn't have to touch it, is you're very good with being... Um, aggressively business hmm. okay you're very good at that mm. you're very good at thinking in terms of business mm. what do i need how do i need it and just exploring business mm -hmm. you inherited that piece it works for you you haven't had to tailor it at all that's it works beautifully for you the second piece that you have that you tailored was a need to be heard mm. We talked about, you know, you got this from your father, mm -hmm. and it works needing to be heard, but you tailored it. You took it from um, a maniacal, <laughs> <laughs> demanding, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to you, you completely tailored it, and now you just simply know you want to be heard, and you are willing to do what you need to do. To be understood, mm -hmm. understood, okay? I that. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece that you tailored. Mm -hmm. A piece that you threw out was your fear of truly getting involved with love. Mm. You threw it out. Mm -hmm. You threw it out. You said, you know what? Love is love, and I want to be in love, and I like love, and love is good, and sometimes we bump up against the plexiglass wall, but I want to be in love, so I am throwing out the piece that I cannot be in love. Mm, well, and I think my parents have a very beautiful relationship, but it's not one that I would want to create for myself. I just want some a different level of connection or type and of connection. Exactly, and you used to think that love had to look like your parents' marriage. Yeah, and I think that's why I called off my wedding because I think I bought into a lot of beliefs around what I, what would be the right thing and uh -huh. thinking, oh, I really shouldn't break up with this person because look at my family, this is love. And it's like getting to that point where, and I, and I love this little sweet spot, right? Where your conditioning is coming up against who you really are. It's like that caterpillar that it hurts to not be a butterfly. Yes, yes. And so that's when you know what's instinct. What is instinct? Instinct is when you are having a yearning. You're like this sunflower that's looking for the sun and they keep turning you toward the moon, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you are, you are wanting, you're desiring, you're yearning 
you and you know the direction you want to go in. It's visceral. It hurts not to go in that direction. Mm. In other words, when you were going to be married, it hurt to think that you would follow through and get married. Yes. And now in the relationship you have, now we hit pieces number four. Now you get to forge all the new pieces that you want to have. Mm. How do you want your relationship? How do you and William want to relate? How, how much time do you and William want to spend? Oh, you're saying his name many times. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there's his name again. Woo. <laughs> I love the name William. It's so sensuous. William. Oh my God. See, that's another thing. In shamanism, we always use the full name. It's very powerful. Mm, Not that we can't, I can't be called Tati, because people will call me, hi, Tati. But my name is Tatiana. Mm. You see, there's power in that name. Ashley. To be called Ash, yes, it's very sweet. It's, it means that I, it's an endearment. I pull you close to my heart with that. But Ashley has its own energy. So interesting. I never thought about that. Oh, Ashley. Ashley flows. It's like the wind. Mm. Ashley. It just keeps going. Mm. Tatiana you. is more compact. Tatiana. It's compact. It sounds like a warrior. And because I know you're Apache, it feels like I'm picturing that whole thing. Yeah. And then William. <laughs> oh, he just rolls off your tongue. Oh, my God. <laughs> But it does. Come on. You have to go with me on this. William. I mean, I agree. I'm like in love with the guy. So it's like, you know. Um, Yes, but it's such a, not sexy, not sexy. It's a sensuous name. I'm going to pass on the message (laughs) to let him know. (laughs) That's amazing. I I hope his boss enjoys this episode too. Shout out to uh, William's boss if you're listening. You know, you're welcome. Um, so kind of in closing, what, what have I not asked you or what do you think would be so powerful for people to know that I haven't covered with you? I want people to know that they're not crazy. They're not broken. And there's nothing that needs to be fixed. You have some bad habits. Those can be located and dealt with. But your instinct is alive and well, and that's why you're in pain. And that's why if you're doing anything to numb yourself, that's what you're trying to numb. You're trying to numb what you know. Mm. And you, you want to know what you know, because what you know is your artwork. That's your art. Did you, did you guys hear how Ashley just got all bubbly and just the sweetness and the nectar that just oozed out of her when we were laughing about William? Oh could, could you guys hear that? Could you feel it? Of course you could. That's the sensuousness that we all possess. Mm. You know, this reminds me of uh, a lot of the love episodes. I've heard some experts um, talk about how men just want a woman that makes them feel more alive. And in order to make somebody feel alive, you need to be alive, right? Yes. And that's the sensuality that I'm interpreting is aliveness. Yeah. It, a sensuality to me means, and the, the, the word to me that would be synonymous with sensuality is invitation. Oh, wow. Beautiful word. Great. Okay, Tatiana, I could go... Tatiana, now I'm picturing you in the forest like a, a warrior. Um, what, what can I... Where can everybody find you? You have such incredible work. How do you work so that anybody who wants to get in touch can? Well, you can actually call me, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you my cell phone for, for one, 714-615-1813. And my email... I'll say it slowly. It's all consonants. It's naked bliss with no vowels. So N K D B L S S at AOL.com. And yes, I still have AOL. I don't have Gmail like all the fancy. <laughs> I was just thinking people. about the modem sound like, <laughs> like you've got mail. Like, what? <laughs> I love I this. I miss. I miss when it used to say you've got mail. I'd get so excited. <laughs> now it's like you've got a shit ton of mail and we got to hit the delete button. Now it's like a punishment. <laughs> Great. And then my my web page, I believe it's called. Keep me up to date, lady. Uh, right? My web website. Page. Yeah, your website. <laughs> my web page. 
I mean, that's just one page. Does your website, a website has multiple pages they can go to, but if you have one page, then it's your web page. I have a website. So that's Tatiana, T-A-T-Y-A-N-A, Ray, R-A-E, TatianaRay.com. Wonderful. This is so helpful. And, um, Tatiana mentors so many people in just their aliveness and I think um, releasing the lies that they're telling themselves, of course. And I had been one of them. And thank you so much for being on the show. This was so great. Thank you. And I love you, William. If you're making her happy, I love you already. <laughs> just had to throw in that name one more time, you know? Why not? We're, we're here now. We're committed. It's just like most people, right? Like, they realize something is feeling a little scary, and then they keep doing it. <laughs> that's, that's... Oh, honey. It's just everything has its timing. Everything is beautiful. Immerse yourself. Mm, thank you. Accept the invitation. Hey, it's Ashley here from Ashley International, and I want to talk to you about the phenomenon of taking space for yourself and how to really get clear on where that's coming from inside of you, whether it's healthy and you just want some space to air something out or whether you don't have a healthy relationship with space. So I want to kind of explore this topic and forgive me if I'm wordy as usual, I'm trying to explore this with you as we talk because I have so many thoughts and they're all over the place. But have you ever found yourself perhaps calling and texting people nonstop looking for a plan, almost like it's air in your lungs that day? Like it's almost like the the space and the silence in your life is noisy and you want to fill it with people. You know, have you ever found yourself maybe feeling like, oh my gosh, it's just too hard to be alone? I have a friend, one of my favorite people, her name is Nicole. And she and I traveled to Bali together. And when we were on our travels, she had pointed out to me saying that she has some judgments on how much time she's taken away to enjoy this trip for herself. And it struck me as really interesting that her relationship with space is that she doesn't deserve a belief that she doesn't deserve all the space she might want to take. Um, we all have different beliefs about taking time to ourselves, taking space. And this was really profound to her when we were on this trip for her to realize that she's judging herself for taking space. She has a belief that she should be with her group, her family, her boyfriend, her friends, and that it's selfish to want space. Really, really interesting. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, busyness is a culturally acceptable insanity. And I just want to say that again because, wow, busyness is a culturally acceptable insanity. It is insane. The badge of honor that we all think we are wearing by being busy. And the question I want to ask you is, are you creating a busy life or are you actually engaging in things that are supportive to who you are? I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs have spent the entire day working, 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 but really they're not doing anything that's moving the needle in their business. They're just working for the sake of being busy. And the question becomes why? Why are they creating so much chaos and busyness inside of themselves? And the answer that I've come up with for them is that when we're busy, they're, they're, it, it feels like we're valuable. A lot of the times that's the belief. The busier you are, the more valuable you are. And so I want to ask you, do you feel a sense of that? And you can kind of track it back to your conversations. Like, you know, maybe you're talking to people at dinner and they're like, what's new with you? And you just talk about how busy you are. It's like the more you talk about it, the more that you identify with being busy. And that's a slippery slope because if you identify with being busy, that does not mean you identify with being productive or being healthy or being happy. So I just want to challenge this idea of being busy. And this also relates to the idea of taking space and being alone and having space in your life. And I think the reason for that is that a lot of people are uncomfortable with with being in space to the point where they create a busy life. They force it on themselves because the idea of having space feels really scary and uncomfortable. So, of course, I wouldn't be me if I didn't intrusively ask you to really think about that. Um, Are the things in your life really enriching you? 
Or are you just creating a ton of busy to feel valuable and to feel like your life matters, to feel like your time matters? And the bigger qu question that I really want to ask is, what are you want running from? Because if you're creating a lot of busy, a lot of the times you're running from stillness, you're running from being alone, you're running from space. And when people are running from space, usually there's a fear of it. And this kind of brings me back to my friend, Nicole, you know, her and I were talking when we got back from Bali, obviously you can tell I just love her. <laughs> and, you know, she was just talking to me about how she's been creating a lot of space for herself and that Bali was kind of a starting point for that. And, you know, how rich that has been for her, you know, because it's not until we create the space that we are able to ask ourselves who we are and what we want to really put in it, not for the sake of being busy, but for the sake of being connected to ourselves and what we really want to do with our time and how we're going to build a relationship with ourselves. How are we going to go have a date with ourselves? Because it can be overwhelming if you're not used to creating a lot of space for yourself. And one of the most important things that I've learned over all of these years in personal development time and time again is that you cannot find good answers in the noise. So if you're creating a very noisy life for yourself, there is no way that you are going to find the best answers on what you should do next what feels right for you, what relationship is right for you, what career move is right for you, what friendships are right for you. And it's very subjective, right? But you're never going to get clear on what's right for you unless you create enough stillness inside of yourself to hear the answers. You know, I remember um, years and years ago, I had a roommate, really fun girl, and she used to come home sometimes and I would be laying on the floor staring at the ceiling. And it's not like I did this all the time, but I would do it, you know, maybe every couple of weeks she'd find me there and she would look at me and I would look at her when she walked in and she would say, looking for answers. And I would say, you know it. <laughs> so I think one of the most important things you could do, one of the biggest gifts you could give yourself is the gift of space to find the answers that you're looking for. So the question that I want to ask you now is, is there an important decision you're making to look in your life right now? It could be about a relationship. It could be about a friendship. It could be about your career. And whatever that decision is that you're looking to make, are you creating enough stillness for you to hear the answer? But what a powerful question, you know, for you to really ask yourself, are you creating the environment for you to come up with the answer? Um, and one thing that I found with a lot of people who have a lot of noise and who are very busy, and believe me, I have so been one of those people. I love a good busy, busy schedule. It's like, at the end of the day, I find that these people, including myself, we just do, do, do to find answers. Instead of eliminating things from our lives to create space and stillness to hear the answers, we add more things into our lives a lot of the times. And it just creates a whole lot of busyness and chaos that makes it even noisier to hear yourself. So my invitation to you is this. Give yourself some space, set up some alone time for you, create some stillness, and really meditate on whatever question you are trying to get an answer for. And maybe you want to take a, a note out of my past emails to you and let life show you the answer through experiences or create space in your mind to hear the answer if that's the way you want to do it. And the other question I have for you is why are you so busy? Are you running from something? Do you identify with your career? Are you scared of who you'd be without it? And I just hope that you can find out who you are in the space because you are a beautiful being and you can only see it when you have the space to see it. So with that, I'm signing off. I'm sending you so much love. Again, this is Ashley from ashleyinternational.com. And um, I send you so many blessings. Take care. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the U-Turn Podcast. We keep really detailed show notes at U-TurnPodcast.com. So if our guest mentioned a book or a resource that you're interested in, you'll be able to find that there. In the meantime, if you were inspired by this episode, if it made an impact in your life, we would be so grateful if you subscribed and posted a review for us on iTunes. Rumor has it on the street, the more reviews we get, the more subscribes we get, the more we can grow and get our impact out there in the world. In the meantime, I'd love to hear from you at Ashley Stahl on Instagram. I'm so grateful for connecting.